We have a couple of announcements. Uh, we're starting today a series on marriage, a sacred union. And for the next four weeks, I'm going to be speaking. Actually, the next three weeks, I'm going to be speaking, and we're going to have some experts join us on September 20th, Bob and Maria Coe. But on the evening of Sunday, September 26th, there's going to be a marriage date night at First Baptist uh, Orlando. First Baptist Orlando. It's going to be a comedy night, and it's designed for couples. Uh, you can get advanced tickets for couples at ExtremeFaithProductions.com. ExtremeFaithProductions.com. I have one of these lying on the black tablecloth table outside in the foyer, um, but I'll announce it again next week. On October 16th, James and Pastor Jeremy are putting together a basketball tournament for the young men in the neighborhood. Uh, if you can support us anyway, uh, please reach out to them. They'll be glad to help you. And on October 30th, our annual trunk or treat, which we had to skip last year due to COVID, is going to happen. Uh, Val with Crosspoint uh, downtown is going to help us. Uh, the Coxes are going to be out of town that day. And they've already met with the other churches and started work on that. If you'd like to help with donations or uh, using your car as a trunk or running a game, please contact uh, Stephanie Allman. She'll take your name and work with that. Well, that's it. Pastor Jeremy is going to open us today with a special song, and then I'll dive right into the message. to describe somewhere I've never been where there is no sorrow and no curse of sin but I get a real homesick feeling inside with every refrain about sweet paradise Saints love to sing about heaven, beautiful, marvelous heaven, sweet land of all the forgiven. Saints love to sing about home. It thrills my heart to know there is a place reserved just for me at the table of grace. The old will be young and the weak will be well, and all of God's children forever shall dwell. Saints love to sing about heaven, beautiful, marvelous heaven, sweet land of all the forgiven. Saints love to sing about oh, the sweetest song home where my heart belongs sweet land of all the forgiven saints love to sing about home saints love to sing about home saints love to sing
I just sit back down and we'll let Jeremy do that for 20, 30 more minutes. How would that sound to y'all? Turn with me in your Bibles to two places. I know I've been doing that a lot lately. Put your finger here and hold your finger there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And Ephesians 5, 25. While uh, you're getting there, Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5, we're glad to have our monitors back on. Our great sound guy, William, and a leader at Crosspoint came in this week and worked on them until they found the problem. I'm not sure if we'll have song lyrics up. We're working on that. Uh, it threw a loop and everything. But we, we've had worse. You know, we're so glad to be here. And then also while you're turning, and let me give you the reference one more time, Genesis 2.18. And hold your finger at Ephesians 5.25. We had our back to school event a few weeks back. And um, as many of you know, despite a lot of planning, we had a terrible downpour. Not just rain. And we converted it to a drive through uh, back to school blast. I mean a downpour. I think that was the lightning storm that knocked out all of our internet here. So we only had two cars come through. Uh, I think six children, five children, but we took some of the backpacks and distributed them uh, to other children in our extended family uh, through some of the workers in the church. Well, this morning, Jackie Ortiz tells us that her nephew, Jaden, how old is Jaden, Jackie? Eight years old, took his allowance and packaged it in a little white envelope as a gift to the church as a thank you for his backpack. And I thought that was really sweet. That's just a great story. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Genesis 2.18 Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. I should tell you I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and some of the sermon today will be from the New English Translation. Let's go to Ephesians 5. I'm going to read verse 25, and then I'm going to read verse 32. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And gave himself for her. Now, skipping down to verse 32. This mystery is great, but I'm actually speaking with reference to Christ and the church. This mystery is great, but I'm actually speaking with reference to Christ and the church. You want to hold those two places, maybe grab a pen from the pew or something and mark, but stick them in your Bible because we're going to come back to them. Let's pray. Father, we're once again really glad to be here today. And I just want to personally thank you that you have preserved me in my walk with you and my companionship with my wife, Patty, to allow me to be here. First off, Lord, on merits of my own personal choices, as we remind ourselves every week, I do not deserve to speak to these people. It's only because of this profound contradiction that you, the creator of the universe, would die for all my mess, that I'm allowed to stand here at peace with you. And then of the many times I have hurt Patty and been domineering or controlling or unfaithful in my thoughts, I do not deserve to stand here. But oh, the amazing grace of God that forgives and heals and perseveres. We need you today, Jesus, as we tackle this important topic, marriage. Please be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What I'm going to tell you now, uh, it comes from, from excerpts of the article, Losing My Diamond Ring Helped Me See the Real Gem, by Nancy Hockman. One morning I was washing my hands when I noticed the empty prongs of my diamond ring standing up at me like some bizarre surgical tool. As the water poured down the drain, my heart sank with it. 
thinking that the diamond might have fallen off during the hand washing, I elicited the help of my ever fix it machine husband, Mason. With a short time, wrench in hand, he took the parts apart below the sink, looking for my gem among the tar covered muck. You see, Nancy had already searched the sheets and the cover in the bedroom, scanned the floors, but they both came up short. Pastors often talk about the wedding band and the wedding ceremony and its never ending circle as a representation of a commitment in marriage that's to be forever. But it's often the diamond ring that means more sentimentally to the bride than the wedding band. Why is that? Diamonds are rare. They're costly, as we guys know. So the weddings that last a lifetime are rare and costly. And that's what makes them sacred, at least one thing. Something that's sacred and cherished and worth fighting for even revered by others. Think about it. How many times have you seen a couple in their 80s holding their hands as they walk along and not had a hushed feeling of joy in your heart? So is true of Nancy's diamond ring that represented her symbol of her marriage. She continues, When Mason and I married, I asked him to gift me the ring my Aunt Dottie had. Aunt Dot had given her the ring as she passed away. She writes, I still remember Sam and Dot holding hands well into their 70s while taking walks. I had always wanted to look at a partner with the same love with which Dot looked at Sam, especially after 30 years. Now, Sandy says, excuse me, not Sandy, um, Nancy says she wasn't totally surprised when later on that same day, her well-grounded, eagle-eyed husband walked into the bedroom and intuitively looked down on the rug under her computer desk, picked up the diamond that had become dislodged in the ring, settled, and unceremoniously laid it in my hand. She says a wave of relief flooded over her as she saw the ring and the man whose devotion to her it represented it. He, she goes on to say that never to let the grass grow under her feet, his feet, Mason immediately offered to go down to the local neighborhood jewelry store and have it reset. Not long after he's gone, he calls her back on the phone saying the jeweler says the setting is basically shot. We need to get a new set. You want a bigger one? No, I, I like that setting just like Aunt Dot had. Well, do you want a bigger diamond? She goes, No. I have two rocks in my life that hold me up, God and my husband. And through these supportive rocks, I have beautiful family and friends. No, I don't need anything more, she says. That ring represents the sacred union that she and Mason had years ago. Now, uh, Patty and I at one point had discussed upgrading her stone, her diamond. Um, when we first got married, I actually didn't get her an engagement ring, and that's a whole other story for another day. But when I finally did give her her engagement ring on Mother's Day after we were married, it wasn't really that much to speak about. Uh, times were tight. So we had discussed upgrading her diamond. So what did I do? I planned a secret surprise. I took that ring. She had taken it off for some reason. It was irritating her or something, or she was afraid it would come unset. And I went and had it replaced. Diamond and setting. Are the ladies snickering yet? On the planned evening, uh, we had uh, a student at the house, a college student, helping to babysit. And it just worked out that she was there and Patty was there. It was going to be a big deal. Honestly, I was quite proud of myself, so I wanted this college student, Carrie, to see what I did. I got down on a knee and whipped out that brand new honking fat diamond. I think it's like a, a 16th of a carat or something. <laughs> Along with its new setting, and the first thing Patty says, where's my ring? I said, baby doll, it's gone. You said to trade it in. She said, no, I meant the stone. And that beautiful evening fell apart pretty fast. That ring is gone. But obviously... We boneheaded males don't quite understand everything. So today, as we kick off this message, I want to talk about why 
the marriage is a sacred union, just as that diamond ring represents a sacred union. So the first part I want to ask is, why is it sacred? Why is this union that is so rocky, so beautiful, it can bring the worst lows and the greatest highs, why is it sacred? Excuse me, I have got my points wrong. <laughs> why is it sacred is point two? It's been a long time since 5 a.m. this morning. Why the union? Why is the union? Then we'll get to why is it sacred. So here's the answer to that. It's because we were created for companionship. We were made this way. If you look back in Genesis 2, uh, 18, or 2, 18, we see that it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a companion him for him in one translation that says, who corresponds to him. If you look in verse 8, backing up, this is that beautiful setting in the garden before we messed everything up. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. Skipping down then to verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who's just right for him. Some of you are saying, <clears throat> Better dig deep, Pastor. I've had those nights. So the Lord formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to name them. But as you know, there wasn't a companion found suitable for him. The end of verse 20 says, But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall in a deep sleep, and he took a rib uh, from his side and formed woman. In fact, the same word for form is a... Uh, the word used sometimes in the Old Testament for architectural buildings. God crafted a masterpiece. Peace. Adam says, at last, this one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she's taken from man. And then the key verse, verse 24. This explains why. This explains why. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Why? Because we're not created to be alone. We are created to be together. God's plan for companionship in the genders, the closest form of companionship, is marriage. But I don't actually like this translation. I did some, some work on this. And renowned Jewish scholar and Hebrew Bible translator, Robert Alter, has a different translation of this famous phrase in verse 18. Instead of helper who is just right for him, he translates this as, I will make him a sustainer beside him. A sustainer beside him. And that phrase is echoed in verse 20 after Adam names all the animals. No sustainer sustainer by beside him was found. You see, Alter says the word help is too weak because it suggests an auxiliary fun function, and that's not good enough. Now, some of you ladies, that's where you should have said amen. The word we translate help in the Hebrew actually calls for active intervention on behalf of someone. Active intervention on behalf of someone especially in military contexts. Now, don't let your mind go to there as like the, the, um, the War of Roses or all the marriages, fatal attraction, where marriage is a war. That's not where we're going. But Psalm 115, nine, verses 9 through 11, and the New English translation gets it right. This is a psalm of Israel and their military conquest. Verse 9, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their deliverer and protector. Same word as the woman's role as a helper fit for him. Verse 10, O family of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their deliverer and protector. Patty is my deliverer and my protector. And the children will tell you I need one. Verse 11, you loyal followers of the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their deliverer and protector, a helper who fits me. 
We need that companion who is also our military deliverer and protector in the trenches that are known as life. C.S. Lewis says that the primary inclination of a wife is to protect her husband and children. The primary inclination of a wife is to protect her husband and children. Now, if you're not married yet, ladies, you may not sense that. But you get that little baby in your arms. Hmm. It took me a long time to realize this, that often when my wife senses harsh feelings towards someone outside our family, it's often because she sees them as a threat to me or to my children. And once I begin to realize that, instead of fighting her for that, I begin to think about it as a, as a good attribute. Think of the 17th and 18th centuries rituals of two men dueling with pistols. What's the name of the guy who stands beside the dueler? He's helper. That's his second. If you've watched any period films on PBS lately. The guy who stands with the dueler is called his second. You see, a second would take the place of the primary dueler if the dueler was not able to finish the job. Ever seen or tried to interact with a mama bear and her cubs? On the Appalachian Trail, we're often told black bears aren't a problem, don't worry about them, unless mama has her cubs. It's not a good idea. The NIV puts it really well in verse 24 when it says, That is why a man leaves his father and mother. We need a companion for life. We're meant to be together. And we guys need a deliverer and protector. It's simply not good for us to be alone, especially us guys. Right, William? This is what most guys look like before marriage. A big frat party. I tell people Patty raised four children. She's still raising one. Now, obviously, when I say this up, bring this up, there are issues involved. Those who are divorced, those who are widowed, those who are celibate, those who haven't found someone yet. There are exceptions, and I'm not calling any person, male or especially female, incomplete who does not have a partner. That's not what I'm saying. The exceptions make the rule. But otherwise, it simply isn't good, especially for us men, to live alone. Complementary companionship is God's plan for the genders. Point two. Why the sacred part? Why is marriage sacred? It feels like a train wreck. I think during the parenting series, I told of an argument Patty and I had that went till two in the morning. And I apologize um, to her for sharing some of the uglier parts of our lives. But if I don't, you guys are going to live, you're going to follow the fallacy that a pastor is perfect. Now, uh, Pastor Renault of Mosaic Church in Winter Garden gets up and says, my wife and I had a fight this week. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. There are some things sacred in our marriage that we're not sharing. But it's for that reason that I do that. So why, why is marriage sacred? How can we say that when we fight like cats and dogs? Or we don't talk it ever? Or we haven't been intimate in years? Well, marriage is sacred because it represents Christ and us. Marriage represents Christ's love for us. Now, if you're not married yet, divorced or widowed or want to get married, I'm going to address you too. But you need to learn this. This is a core teaching of the Christian church. It's been around for centuries. Look at Ephesians 5.21. Let's back up to verse 21. This whole passage on marriage that Paul gives us starts with verse 21. And the New English translation starts it by saying this way. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now next week, I'm going to deal with the role of the husband. And I'm not going to be dealing with the role of the wife in this series. Even my female guest speaker, the wife of Bob Coe, is not going to primarily deal with that. Why? Because I think the role of the husband is far more important in controlling the health of a marriage and is the leading role to which the wife's role responds. Why do I say that? Because marriage is an illustration of Christ in the church. Look at verse 25. 
For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Now, before you read any more, let me ask this, you saints of old. Did Christ die for you before you were ready and cleaned up or after you were ready and cleaned up? Before, I heard someone say it. Paul says this in Romans 5, verse 8. Christ shows, proves his love for us that while we were still sinners. Now he's talking in the present tense in probably 80, 50, 60 or so. And so they were alive right then when Jesus died. And he says, Christ proved that he loved me. Jesus proved that he loved me while we were still sinners. And for Paul, he had to say in his heart, while I was a murderer. Paul was the guy who was responsible for Stephen's murder for following Christ. This is the way God loves us, and this is the way God calls for marriage to be conducted. Verse, verse 25 again. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Verse 28, in the same way, in the same way, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. And what did Jesus do in demonstrating that love? Guys, what did he do? He died. Do you think this just means dying at the end of the life, riding off in the sunset, getting hit by a train? No, it means daily dying. And guys, it's hard. And we'll talk more about that next week. Verse 20, 31. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Verse 32. This is a great mystery. This is a great mystery, but it, meaning marriage, is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. You see, it's God's design that marriage is an illustration of Jesus' love for fallen humanity. It's the number one symbol on earth that should show what Christ has done for us. His unconditional love. A picture of that. How? How can our marriage be that? One time we had an argument when we were first married. I think it was argument number 672. And we were at a church choir function and we had a disagreement, and in front of everyone there, I took my mother's side. Two miles later, she picked me up on the highway. I think it, literally. Don't do that, guys. Don't do that. When we marry someone, we say, I choose to love you long after the feelings are gone. Because Christ loves me day in and day out, no matter what I do. Because I've given myself to him. Actually, he loved me before I gave myself to him. With that ring, we are saying, I choose to love you when you don't deserve it. And I can't wait to get into this next week, guys. Because C.S. Lewis says, guys, your marriage looks most Christ-like when you choose to love her when she least deserves it. You married to an alcoholic wife? Do you love her dyingly? Then you have a Christ-like marriage. Because that's what Christ does day in and day out for us. When they deserve it the least. And that's one of the core principles of marriage. That I promise to love you when you deserve least to be loved. What do the vows say? For better or for worse. Marriage is sacred, first and foremost, for this reason. And that's why, first and foremost, it's under attack. Now, I, I came out of the Pentecostal tradition, so I'm a little nervous about saying there's a demon under every rock. But the truth is, there is an enemy who is out to destroy your marriage, your future marriage, and the institution of marriage in every place on this earth. And unless you are willing to fight for it, he's going to win. I don't mean fighting with each other. If he can destroy marriage, especially among followers of Jesus, he has destroyed God's number one method of showing the world what his unconditional love is. 
you're going to have to make a choice to fight for. And that includes sacrificing of yourself, giving up some of yourself to keep it. You're going to have to fight and fight for all you've got. I, I, I've just wrestled with today with how to communicate how important it is. Young men, before you're married, fight for purity. Young women, don't give yourself to anybody but that guy that puts a ring on your finger. In the 1989 blockbuster film, The Abyss, by director James Cameron, one of the best films, in my opinion, of all time, formerly married, now divorced, petroleum engineers Bud Brigman, played by Ed Harris, and Lindsay Brigman, played by Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, are hired to help this trigger-happy Navy SEAL find a nuclear sub that's been mysteriously sunk. In a compelling scene, they're together... They've been thrown together, working together, even though they're divorced and been apart for years. They're now in this broken mini-sub, thousands of feet underwater, and with a good distance to swim to get to the underwater sea lab. The problem? They only have one dive suit, and thus only one air supply. And the only way they can survive, Lindsay says, is if Bud, the stronger swimmer of the two, puts the suit on, swims back in the nearly freezing water, dragging beside him the drowning Lindsay. She knows this is the only way it'll work. And he argues with her. She says, you've got to do this. So when they arrive back at the underwater station, dragging her cold, dead body, he and the other crew members start to work on her. They immediately administer CPR. They give her a shot of whatever they do, adrenaline. They shock her repeatedly with a defibrillator. After it becomes obvious to the rest of the crew that there's no hope, Bud continues to administer CPR on his own, alternatively breathing in her and then doing chest compressions, screaming, No! Five minutes this goes on. And he goes silent. And then he screams, no, again, tears streaming down his face. And he actually slaps her dead body. Now, guys, I wouldn't advise that, but it's a great uh, scene. And he starts yelling at his dead wife, fight, fight. You've never backed away from anything in your life. Fight, fight. And then he finally yells, fight. And she begins to choke and cough, and she lives. You see, finally he's figured out he can't live without her. And he loves her and he wants to fight for their marriage. And he wants her to fight for her life and their marriage too. You've got to fight for this. It's so sacred. It's so important. Your children are depending on you to fight for it. For you singles. Marriage is sacred and I need you to fight for purity now. For those of you who are dating and engaged, I need you to fight by waiting to be intimate with that one. For those of you who your marriage is in trouble, marriage is sacred and I'm begging you to fight. Please show up every week. Your family needs you to fight. For those of you who are married and at the moment happy, marriage is sacred. And I need for you to fight for its sacredness too. By learning new things. By continuing to model dating your spouse. For those of you who are divorced and widowed, only you know your pain. The loss. If you feel you might get married again one day, you too can fight by learning new things in this series. If you're divorced and widowed and never plan to marry again, you can fight too in this community. People need your stories. That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ is sharing and loving together. Come on, you guys. Let's fight. Fight. Fight for your marriages. I beg you. It is the heart of this church. It is the heart of your families. Please fight for your marriages. Jeremy. We learned a song it was a couple weeks ago called Sinking Deep. Some of you have the sheets of paper, and we're going to try to get the lyrics up as well on the screens. 
talking about the perfect love of Jesus that he has for us. And as we reflect on the sermon, seeing how we can reflect this love to our significant others. Standing here in your presence, in a grace so relentless, I am one by perfect love. Wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, sinking deep in mercy sea. I'm wide awake, drawing close, stirred by grace, and all my heart is yours. All fear removed, I breathe you in, I lean into your love. Oh, 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 oh your love. When I'm lost, you pursue me. Lift my head to see your glory, Lord of all. So beautiful. Here in you I find shelter, captivated by the splendor of your face. My secret place, I'm wide awake. Drawing close, stirred by grace, and all my heart is yours. All fear removed, I breathe you in, I lean into your love. Oh, oh, oh your love. Your love so deep is washing over me. Your face is all I seek. You are my everything. Jesus Christ, you are my one desire. Lord, hear my only cry to know you all my life. Your love, your love so deep is washing over me your face is all i seek you are my everything jesus christ you are my one desire lord hear my only cry to know you all my life i'm wide awake Drawing close, stirred by grace, and all my heart is yours. All fear removed, I breathe you in, I lean into your love. Oh, your bow your heads with me. Normally this is our time, not only for confession, but to pray for the nations. But we're going to focus on us today. If God's word and the band's song has stirred you by grace and drawn you closer, this is a time to have a chat with the Lord. Not with me, not with your spouse. I'm not going to ask for any show of hands. I think this is very sacred and very private.
as you think back over this week, this year, this decade, and this marriage, there are probably things you're not proud of. In your heart right now, I'd just like you to confess those to the Lord. Lord, here are the areas I failed you. Jesus, I'm not even very good at talking to you. I'm not even completely sure you're there. But here are the areas that I have failed you. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you can still go along with this. I'm going to help you. You can begin today if you've been touched in your heart because he died for you before you were even worth dying for. And now I just want you to ask him this. And you can repeat in your heart. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of these messes I've made this week, this year, this decade, and this marriage. Please forgive me once again by your profound contradictory grace. And if you've never asked him before, you can ask him right now, Jesus, I don't understand, but I sense you today. Please come into my life for the first time and I'll accept your death as payment for my sin. Please come into my life and forgive me. Oh God, you're so good. Human words cannot put into speech the craziness of this story. And that you would choose us, the most profoundly contradicted creatures on earth, who would build the Twin Towers and then murder 3,000 people doing it, drop a bomb and kill 300,000 at once, or murder 6 million Jews, that you would choose us to symbolize your great sacrifice. We bring these failures to you today. And God, we're so glad that you cover them with your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to sing a couple familiar tunes here. I think you should know it, maybe. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, which goes into awesome God. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. One more time. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Our God, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Lord, I've come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I've found. In you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me. 
will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close, let your love surround. spirit leads me on by the power of your love Lord unveil my eyes let me see you face to face the knowledge of your love as you live in me. And Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life, in living every day. By the power of your love, hold me close, let your love surround me, bring me near, draw me to your and as I wait I'll rise up like the eagle and I will soar with you your spirit leads me on in the power of your love be seated. Thank you, Jeremy. Ushers, would you come forward? We want to update you. Donna Cox is in the hospital. If you've not heard, uh, she came down with some type of sickness over the weekend, which they first thought might be COVID, but was not. Three tests and she's negative. Turns out Donna's had a severe kidney infection for some time and did not know it. And it got serious. Glenn took her to the hospital had a 12-hour wait in the waiting room, and she's in Orlando Health on Orange Avenue. I spoke to her two days ago, and she sounded pretty rough. I spoke to her yesterday, and I thought it was one of her daughters. She was so spunky, it sounded like good old Donna. They are still running tests to make sure that the infection is no further than her kidneys, but uh, things are looking better. We're going to pray for Donna as we pray for the offering. Uh, Faye is still in rehab. And I see Bud and Jackie are not here today, and Ann West is not feeling well. Thank the Lord that Floyd is feeling a little better and is with us today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for these gifts that you've given us. We remind ourselves that we are richer than three-quarters of the world. Help us, Lord, today to give sacrificially, cheerfully, investing in your kingdom. It really is an investment to see the fruit you bring of it. We pray you'd bless the families that give today, bless those that are struggling, bless them financially, and bless these funds. May they go to the right things to reach this neighborhood, to tell people about this crazy story. God, we lift up our dear sister Donna. We're, we're glad she's doing better. We pray you'd continue to heal her and use the doctors. We lift up dear sweet Faye in Conway Rehab Home. We pray you'd continue to strengthen her. 
for Bud and Jackie, Ann and Floyd and others, we pray for a complete healing. We ask this all in Jesus' name. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort. My shelter, tower of refuge and strength Let every breath and all that I am Never cease to worship you Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you. Forever I'll stand Nothing compares to the promise I have in you My Jesus, my Savior Lord, there is none like you all of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love my comfort my shelter tower of refuge and strength let every breath and all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the sea will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. As you go this week, wait. I believe Jeremy has an announcement first before I send you off, okay? Hi, good morning, church. Uh, I, I'll make this short, but um, in, in a, basically in a nutshell, um, my time here has been awesome, wonderful. Uh, the leaders have all become my friends. Um, there, there's a job that, uh, a, a, another church that offered me a position and um, after praying, fasting, even some uh, took a whole week to, to really, in a weekend, last weekend, to really, um, you know, make sure communic over communicating with my family about what the change would be. I've accepted the position. Um, it, it, 
it, it took a lot to, to get to that point, um, but basically it, I had to think about my family. Um, so it, uh, it pays significantly more, <laughs> almost uh, twice as much. Um, and so in thinking about my baby girl who's uh, still in the womb, she'll be born in December, I, I had to, um, you know, uh, say yes to that other position. It's uh, conducting choirs, and that's kind of my area as well. I love leading worship here, but um, it'll be a um, kind of more of what uh, my training actually is is towards. So I wanted to, to let you all know that um, I'll be here for, I've asked for a full month, and they've uh, asked, you know, said that that would be okay, and they understand that uh, I'll do my best to transition as smoothly as possible um, into the new position, but at the same time, supporting the best that I can to help move forward. Thank you, Jeremy. Would you guys tell Jeremy how much you appreciate him? <clears throat> Jeremy called me a few days ago to let me know, and um, he has my full support. There's no scandal here, nothing going on. But new friends, um, I really have enjoyed uh, my meetings with the leadership team, having Jeremy on board, and we're going to miss him. We're Facebook friends. We're going to continue, and he doesn't know, but his contract says he has to come back and sing periodically for us. <laughs> As you go this week, I haven't given you a lot of instructions on how to fight. Don't do the kind of fighting you've already learned. For now, choose to love. Choose to sacrifice and put each other first. And then we'll continue next week when we talk about the role of the husband. Have a great week. Love you guys. Hey, if you stuck around long enough for the end of this video, I just want to thank you again for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. If I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. We want to get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.